Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thanks for joining us on today's podcast of Conversation and Coffee with your co-host Gary Senna and I am Danny Vicente. Thank you for listening whenever, wherever, and however you are joining us. Conversations and Coffee is the place where we share a cup of coffee and allow our curiosity to sit in the driver's seat and explore topics in your industry. Everything from technology to leadership to innovation and so much more. So grab your favorite cup of coffee, sit back, laugh with us while we dive into the topics keeping you up at night. Well, Danny, welcome back to another exciting podcast with Coffee and Conversations. This is our fifth one in our sports, media, and entertainment, our closing podcast. And what's exciting for, for you and I, Danny, is so much has changed since we even actually started these podcasts. So we have a lot to talk about as we wrap this up. Danny? Yeah, that's, that's an absolutely true statement, Gary. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing uh, is for sure, this, this is only ending this five-part series, but this will not be the last time we discuss uh, this industry or have these guys on the call. We do have a returning guest, if you remember. He's a, he's a NFL star, wanted to get drafted, and I think he just missed out on that opportunity, but there's always next year. Uh, and we also, Gary, if you don't know, we have a former Lego engineer. Uh, he wanted to build buildings out of Legos, and it didn't quite work out for him, so now he's here. Uh, so, boys, I will let you uh, introduce yourselves. Ken, if you want to Wow, well, I mean, where do I go from here? You know, uh, didn't make it. Uh, born loser, if you will, and, and now I'm just leading a, a global sports team uh, focused on... on uh, you know, big public venues like sport entertainment properties, uh, in all sincerity. Um, it's been a great run, 15 uh, years at uh, leading this team globally. And uh, we've had a lot of fun over the, you know, close to uh, or over 400 venues that we've uh, we've been able to work with. Awesome. And, and uh, if uh, memory serves me correct, just a couple of weeks ago, Ken, you were uh, you were honored by the Sports Business Journal as a, as a Power Player Award, right? That's true. Very I'm a cool. big power player, so <laughs> very cool. Yeah, it's uh, uh, look, you know, my face is on the article, but the you know the credit goes to the entire team. We we've had a, a really good run at this, and and I believe that we've truly changed the industry as a whole. Um, we went from you know, like you say, 15 years of, of doing this. Uh, we went from technology, uh, you know, uh, in the deepest, darkest uh, areas of, of a venue, um, trying to pull teeth to get somebody to invest in technology, um, to where technology is leading, um, you know, the boardroom discussions and how, you know, technology is, is paying back the business. And and I'd say that we played a significant uh, role in that. So we're proud of our accomplishments. It's great to be recognized by the Sports Business Journal, uh, for sure. Uh, but it is definitely a collection of all of our efforts. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Riz, we're over to you. So I introduced you as a Lego guy. And we don't have to explain that <laughs> to the audience, but, uh, <laughs> but if you don't mind introducing yourself, it'd be uh, kind of fun. Yeah, Lego guy is self-explanatory, thanks to my two boys and my two girls. So uh, yeah, <laughs> ne never made it as a uh, sports professional, but I guess I made it as a professional in sports. So uh, second, okay. second place is not bad for me. I I'm happy with that one. <laughs> But yeah, 15 years at Cisco, super happy to be, you know, the, the transformation that we made in this industry, not a better, not, not another place I'd rather be, you know, other than working in Ken's team and part of this industry. Love it. So guys, as Gary said, this is the fifth one in our series. Now we have talked uh, everything from kind of stadiums and venues and how they've changed to esports and Gosh, that's a big change uh, to media and distribution. You name it, we've touched on it. Um, is there anything that uh, we've discussed over the last, you know, three, four weeks here that, that surprised you guys? Anything you heard over the last four weeks that kind of taken you back or made you think of something in the industry that, that kind of gave you an aha moment? Where did you want to go? Um, yeah, I mean, look. I don't think there's any big surprises. Um, we do a pretty good job in terms of keeping up with the where the market's going. Um, I think you've got to, before you look forward, you kind of got to look back at the last 10 years and see kind of what's happened over the industry in the last 10 years. I mean, who would have thought that 
everyone's going to be walking in with these smart devices. Who'd have thought that, you know, 8K or 16K or, you know, that's going to be the big thing about resolutions, etc. cetera. Um, you know, stadiums were just there to enjoy the game. Um, there was no thought about the fan. There was no thought about so many things. Um, and you see how things have evolved. And now there's more of a care about around the fan, getting insights into the fan. You're seeing how content is massively being disruptive. And I think going forward, there's going to be another disruption in content, um, the way it's being produced, the way it's being delivered, who's owning the content. Um, I know you talked about broadcast a lot in the previous podcast, but I'm a true believer that these owners are going to take more ownership of the of the content. And you're going to see like a Netflix of sports going forward, um, where it's more a la carte and people are going to be more empowered to decide what content they have. Um, and then you've got the players as well. I mean, these players have got millions and millions of followers on their social platforms. So are they going to have a role to play in distributing this content as well? So when you bring together this, the power of the player, the venues and these brands want to take more control of the, the content and, you know, social, e-gaming, et cetera. It's, it's really exciting. And, uh, you know, we've got our fing fingers on the pulse, um, mm -hmm. but I'm just really trying to where this is actually going. Any yeah, I, I would I would say, you know, you've been at this long enough, you, nothing, nothing surprises you anymore. Um, as much as we, we've seen and change, we all talk about writing a book when it's all said and done. Um, but one thing that uh, that did surprise me, I guess, if, if you are, uh, you know, if, if that's the term for it. But um, in, in the previous conversations, we were talking about Bitcoin and the ability to pay for things outside of of you know your traditional methods of of uh transacting and um so the san jose sharks just announced that you can pay for your suite renewal via bitcoin oh, wow. and i'm going huh isn't that interesting we went from you know and it seemed like yesterday but maybe it was just a couple of years ago we were helping venues um go cashless um you know this new concept there was venues that we we're still walking into that you couldn't pay with a credit card. You actually had to pay cash. Um, so, you know, going from, you know, going and finding an ATM to transact to, you know, being able to transact with your credit card. So now you're, you know, you're paying for things with Bitcoin. We've come a long way. You know, you mentioned a, 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 an announcement there, Ken, and a lot of things have been announced since the last time we spoke or when we started this series, we announced a partnership with the NFL. We announced a partnership with McLaren just to name a couple, because there's been several, I don't want to sit here and list them all day, but what are, what are all of these announcements and partnerships that Cisco is taking? Uh, what is that saying about us, the industry? Well, I think it, it uh, represents our dedication to this space, right? I mean, there's, there's two things that you can't argue with, and that is the common language around the world is either through sports or through music. Um, and, you know, if you look at these, the venues that we work with, um, they're a combination of, of everything, right? I mean, from uh, sports to music uh, to Disney on ice, it just, it, it shows that Cisco is really dedicated to, you know, um, not only investing in these venues, um, but actually telling that story. And I think that the story of, you know, success and be the bridge and, and the bridge between bringing people back to happiness, if that's the narrative, then, you know, let's go tell it. But, um, but sports and music, you know, is obviously the common language of the world. And I think that, you know, we, we want to play an important role there. Nice. Yeah, just to, add, I mean, I, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think there, there's the element of trust, you know, that the customers have with Cisco. And they, you know, trust the business unit that we have in sports entertainment, having, you know, run this for, for more than a decade. Um, that says a lot in itself. Um, I think also these venues and brands starting to understand that it's not just about having a partnership for the sake of a partnership and, you know, advertising on LEDs, et cetera. It's the value that you actually bring. Um, and the value comes in several different web formats, right? It's not just the technology. It's a social value. It's the operational side. It's the monetization and the wealth of experience that we bring to these, to these uh, properties, et cetera. That's why they want to partner with Cisco. Um, so, yeah, I'll just add that to what I already said. When, when, it, when it comes to the properties, Riz, what, what are we seeing? What are we seeing on the horizon? What are some of the things that, that these folks are investing in and, and, and 
partnering with Cisco to, to bring to life? Yeah, I mean, I think venues are, the pandemic has absolutely proved that these venues can't survive without the fan in the venue. As much as they talk about the billions that they stream to or they broadcast to, et cetera, we all saw it for ourselves. When the fans are not in the venue, it's not the same. And the moment the doors opened again, it was just, uh, you know, everyone's delighted, everyone's happy, et cetera. So they've got to put the fans center. You know, you start with the fan, you end with the fan. And in fact, I don't know why more of these venues don't have like a chief, finance, a chief fan officer um, just to really talk about the fan and think about the fan. I know you got your the other uh, businesses, et cetera, but there's no one really looking after the fan. So more has to be done around the fan. I mean, the fan is not a customer. He's not like got a decision in terms of who he's going to like one day and walking out the store and going to another store, example. That fan's there for life. Um, so I think understanding the fan a little bit more, building up like, the insights, getting the deeper relationship with the fan, that's going to be critical to their business going forward. Um, and I think the way that sponsorships are done, that's going to change slightly over time as well, going back to why they partner with Cisco. It's got to be more around the social care and the social value um, that they're bringing in and how that translates to what they, they can actually deliver for the fan um, in, in return there. The, the final thing I would say is um, oper operations will change the way they're doing their business. We're still we're seeing the great venues doing a great job in setting the bar. That's fantastic. But there's still you know, a lot of BUs and operation, operational teams out there still making decisions in silos. Um, and I think there's going to be better coming together from ownership level downward to say how these uh, different operations can work a bit more smarter so they are integrating and allowing themselves to innovate that little bit better um, and get the best you know, performance that they want from their teams and from their products and services. I've, I've got to imagine, you know, you, you mentioned the fan and, and over this podcast series, we have talked about uh, stadiums the size of the Dallas Cowboys down to venues for esports that hold 500 people. I've got to imagine, and as the fan is the center of all of these various experiences, there are learnings that people can take, whether it's they're looking at a stadium the size of the Cowboys or they're looking at a small venue for esports. Ken, what are some of those what are some of those learnings that they can take and pass along to one another throughout the throughout the various sectors of sports? I think that you know it it doesn't matter the size of the venue. Um, it, uh, it it really is if you're if you're following the best practices, you know you, you'll be successful. Um, early in, uh, we had um, we were lucky early uh, on with working with the Yankees as you know the first um, new built stadium that uh, we had a part in, and then of course it was the Dallas Cowboys, and so we had some marquee brands that we were working with. A lot of the the feedback that we got when we started to talk to other teams is. Well, we're not the Dallas Cowboys, right? So, um, and, and I was like, well, I was kind of taken aback by that saying, you don't have to be the Dallas Cowboys to understand what they're doing and replicate, you know, a successful formula. And I, I think that that's really it. And, and you know, uh, working with, you know, in partnership with Live Nation, they have small music venues and all over the place. And now you're looking at, to your point, esports venues that were putting in hundreds of millions of dollars into an esports venue that only hosts, uh, you know, 2,500, you know, maybe up to 5,000 people if, if you if you really get crazy. Um, that successful formula has translated. And I think what you'll see, you know, is a very copycat league, if you will. Um, and I don't need to, I don't mean to regionalize this. I mean that, you know, what we learned in Europe can apply here and what we uh, you know, do in North America uh, has been, you know, the, the successful formula down in Australia. So it's, it's really taken best practices, no matter the size of the venue, um, in learning from people that have had success and maybe some of the things that didn't work out well, um, we'll learn from that as well. And do the, to the venues like, pile on one another like venue a opens up in australia and everybody looks at it and says oh how do we make ours a little better a little flashier or are we all each one of those venues siloed um well that's where the ego plays a, a, an important role uh in this industry right um it, you know pardon the pun but it, you know it's keeping up with the joneses right i mean that uh you know there there is the elites in the industry that, that say hey look he can't have a better one than i have right or <laughs> 
they can't be doing it better than we're doing it. And so, of course, we're going to make, you know, if, if your, your, your venue seats 70,000, we want to go 72,000. I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm straight to the point to make a point here, but it, it, it's really that, um, that competitive. Um, now, w when they, when they, um, when they compete on the, on the, the field, you would think some of these rival teams, there's no way that they would try to learn from each other. Maybe they're trying to steal something from each other. Yeah. But in reality, uh, back of office, they are very collaborative. And, you know, they, they try to say, okay, well, if you got a good idea, um, you know, let me, let me steal some of that. Um, and it doesn't just happen in, in sports, Gary. I mean, we're seeing it, you know, look at Las Vegas. If, yeah. if MGM finds out that the Sands is doing something, um, they're all over. <laughs> like, we got to do that too. Um, if you recall, oh. the first, when, when gaming was coming to North America, and we're opening up this whole notion of gambling. Um, Sands immediately reached out to the NFL and cut a deal. You know what I mean? They wanted to be partners. So what did MGM do? They went to the NHL, the NBA, and everybody to follow and said, you know, we need to cut a deal, right? I mean, it's it's that kind of landscape. So, wow. Yeah, you know, the the thing that you you mentioned there, Ken. Everybody kind of trying to double up on one another and copycat league and jump be the first ones in. It, it makes me wonder, you know, when the fans come back, as Riz mentioned earlier, it's not going to be exactly the same. If there's going to be an evolutionary jump of all the stuff that they've done while the fans were away. What are we seeing on the next, what's the next phase? What's that next thing that's going to come down and kind of revolutionize the, the, the sports and entertainment industry? Uh, I'll go and then I'll, I'll let uh, Riz uh, jump in. But, um, you know, for us, I think AI is, is going to be a big one, right? I mean, the ease of use, not having to do things traditionally the way that we always have done it. We talked in, in a previous podcast of that, the, the future of telling your car where to go and drop you off at the front door um, and, and then go find and park itself. And, and by the way, when you stepped out of the car, you know, the, the venue has already scanned your ticket and knows what your preferences are and all this good stuff, right? But the heart of it, you know, I'm, I'm watching the NBA playoffs and I'm watching the NHL playoffs and the venues that do have fans back. The one thing that I, you know, I've always said is being at a, a, at a, a, a sporting event or a concert kind of brings you back to the childhood, right? It, it, it makes you get a passion in it, about what's happening in front of you. And it turns you into that, you know, screaming kid that jumps up and down and hugs a stranger and, you know, just doesn't care because you're so wrapped up in the sport or the moment um, that you, you kind of just, you lose yourself of who you are and, you, you know, the kid inside of you comes back out. And, and in a sense that as much as technology will play an important role uh, of how we consume sports and how we interact with, you know, the venue and, um, and the sport itself, I mean, there's still going to be that kid in us that just, you know, gets wrapped up in watching it and, and you know, gets overexcited when that winning goal is scored. It's true, Ken. And I, I think a lot of the fans are seeing a return to the stadiums as a little bit of a return to normalcy. That, okay, mm. they're kind of breathing deep saying, okay, society's getting back to where we used to be. Yeah, it's all going to be okay. Um, you yeah. know, well, we... We can have fun again. It's okay to smile. Um, you know, the end of the world's not here. So obviously we're sensitive to other places in the world that, you know, are still dealing um, with this right. crisis. But, but you're right. I mean, you know, there, there are pockets, you know, starting in Australia, you know, the, the envy of New, New Zealand, um, you know, being able to play with full stadiums when they were and we were all locked up inside of our homes. But you're right. I think that uh, this does give us a, a sign of hope. Yeah, I think in for UK, you know, doors are starting to open. We're seeing 20, 30% of the ones that don't pick up. So that's uh, light at the end of the very long tunnel. Um, and fans are super happy to get back in. But, you know, whether you're a fan, whether you're a customer, whether you travel, people want experiences and people are happy to pay for the experience. And that's all they're looking for. So whether it's at the local venue supporting your local team, whether it's going to see your kid play, you know, youth football, whether it's going on a holiday, whatever. That's that's the desperation everybody wants, and that's what you get at a at a venue, right? So um, more of the experience, and if you get the experience right, that will allow these venues to start monetizing um, going forward. Um, when you talk about futures, I, anybody, 
you ever talk to him about what does the future hold, I always think about the film uh, with Tom Cruise, Minority Report. Because I think that's just a, such an epic film that just makes you think, walking through a town center and everything is popping up, projections saying, hi, Riz, hi, Riz, hi, Riz. Do you want to buy this? Do you want this? And everything's personalized, but everything is just working brilliantly. So whether you wanted to jump in a taxi, whether he wanted to go into a store, whether whatever he wanted to do, the technology was just working. So when I think about what Cisco can be doing and our eco partners, and it just needs to be everything is seamless, it works, it gets you to your place nicely, it gets you to your seat nicely, it gets you the food and beverage, you can watch the event in any form or way that you want over any device. Um, that's that's what I think about the future. I mean, other technologies are going to pop up and disappear, and some might stay, some might go. Um, that's that's the whole piece around innovation. But I think it's just tapping into the experience that all of us are looking for. Um, that's that's the bit about the future that's that's exciting. I think uh, just uh, just a final point about that though is um, from from an operational point of view and a venue's point of view, the, the other side of the coin when they talk about about fan experience is the operational side and sustainability. And I think that can't be excluded. So when these venues, you know, got RFP now, they are very much looking at what's the green side of this. How do I make sure it's friendly, it's earth friendly, it's, you know, being the supply chain is friendly, you know, things are being delivered in a green way because everyone's going to be starting being measured on that. Um, so there is an aspect of how green we can be and how friendly we can be to the environment around us. You know, as you said that, it, it struck me something that Ken often tells me, and that is really that we are the enablers. You know, you talked about all the all those all those things, Riz, and I and I can't. I don't want to make this a Cisco commercial, but I can't think of you know technologies come and go, uh, things come and go, but the network underlying is always present, and it's what's making that stuff happen. Uh, and and as I think through that, Ken, are we seeing anything that our customers should know or be thinking about as they're looking at their network over the next five or ten years? Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, the, it's all come more efficient. Um, there's no, there's no reason to build independent silo stacks of, of, uh, IT anymore. Um, the convergence of, you know, uh, even if you look at what we're doing, converging the network so that you're not building, um, you know, a network that supports your broadcast. You're not building a network that supports, you know, IT functionality. And then you've got a separate network that supports, you know, all your HVAC and you're building automation stuff. I mean, it, it's one network, right? And so, and you can become so much more efficient when you look at it that way. I mean, when you think about everything that, that you're going to plug into the network, there's no reason to have, um, you know, these different, well, th this operates off of this server that's, you know, running this application. Um, just be more efficient about our approach. And if you think about the buildings that are being, you know, um, uh, you know that we're, we're building in, in the future with smart buildings and everything else, we're definitely leveraging that network um, and the convergence of that network uh, to carry through. There, there's so much throughput that goes on nowadays. You think about um, people using their mobile phones and, and everything that they're doing on their mobile phones and everything that that mobile phone has to do from from allowing you to know where to park or pay, pay for your parking to uh, your ticket into the the, uh, the venue. Um, now be able to control what you order, what you know, the merchandise, you mean, we're we're, uh, we're seeing things to where you can actually see the merchandise on you before you purchase. It. It's all through your phone riding on the network which has to be powerful enough to be able to, to, uh, to do that. Because without the proper connectivity, and we talked about this in the previous series, without the proper connectivity, none of that stuff is possible. So, um, but you shouldn't build a separate network just for that. I mean, it should be on the same network, the intelligence built out of that. Um, and that's what we're really focused on, right? And, and you're right, Daniel, we, we talk about it a lot. We're enabling these types of experiences, whether it's through digital signage or the mobile experience or, or how broadcast is delivered um, as a service. So um, it's just exciting times and, and it's happening so fast. That minority report that Riz referenced, man, 
I, I guarantee if you go watch it today, we're going, hey, we could do half that stuff or, you know, most of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is a minority court. What are you talking about? You know, 2035. We're like here in 21 doing that stuff. It's crazy. It is crazy, Ken. Well, guys, the the one thing that I think uh, we can take away from this series is, is there are lessons to be learned all around. Um, and and uh, no matter kind of what you're thinking uh, about doing, whether that's in venue or from a fan experience, all the way from their house to the venue back home, um, we can help out. Um, but like I always like to end these podcasts, I give you guys an opportunity to give that one final thing that the audience should take away. Um, and I guess I'll start with you, Riz, as this is, as this is new to you. I'll give you my spiel. And that is that most people prepare before they get onto this podcast. Um, and inevitably, Gary and I will disappoint you and not ask you the questions you thought we would. Uh, and so there's a couple of thoughts you have out there that, that you want our audience to know. And this is your free for all. So what, what is that takeaway that you'd like our audience to remember uh, and take away from this podcast? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for the business owners out there, they do a tremendous job in running these brands and, and teams, et cetera. Um, th th there always comes a time when they want to think about the strat strategy and the kind of transformation that they want to journey on the next five, 10 years, et cetera. But what tends to happen is these the strategies, they get um, isolated very quickly. So they end up just doing one project, but it takes maybe five projects to get to that end goal. But they'll just focus on one project like connectivity. We need connectivity. Let's put Wi-Fi in. And then it just stops there. And they didn't think about what else actually is, you know, why was the connectivity put in for the first place? It was, something to do with a fan, um, but what about the layers on top of it? So my call out is if you're going to execute on a strategy, just think it through all the way and just execute the entire strategy, not a component of it, um, because you get something working, but it kind of doesn't give the return on investment that you're looking for. Um, so that, that would be my, my kind of call out for, for the owners out there. Ken, how about you? You know, I... Um... One of the, the meetings that I had early when I first took uh, responsibility of, of driving this uh, vertical for Cisco, um, it was a learning experience for me. I was trying to talk to as many people as I possibly could simply because we didn't know what the business of sport was all about. One of the uh, individuals that I had come out to San Jose was the then just former commissioner of the NFL, Paul Tagliabue. Um, and it was a it was a sit down session with Paul and, and I was trying to learn, you know, what these teams were thinking and, you know, what owners were doing what. And he said, Ken, you know, um, the, there's this saying in the, um, you know, around the world that says, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And what I used to always tell all of these owners is if it's not broke, fix it anyway, because there's always room for improvement. There's always a better way of doing something. And, and uh, I wrote it down that day and it's, it stuck with me, you know, now going on 14, 15 years that, you know, if it's not broke, fix it anyway. Um, from Paul Tagliabue is a very applicable today as it was 15 years ago. Um, there's always a better way of doing something. There's always something that, uh, that you may not be thinking about. Um, that you could be applying to your business um, and whatever you're looking to achieve, right? Whether it's more efficient, uh, a way of doing business or if it's a better fan experience or if it's making more money, um, there's always somebody that's got a really good idea um, that can help improve those things. So so that's it. I mean, for me, if it's not broke, fix it anyway. That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's always sat with me. The wise words of Paul Tagliabue. Gary, I think that's the title of the podcast. Fix it anyway. We'll, we'll put that in there. <laughs> it's really true. Danny, this has been such an exciting series for us because we've been able to watch just uh, uh, events unfold before us that have run simultaneously with the podcast. Nice. So it's been a great learning curve for me. That's good for me as well, for me as well. And folks, if this happens to be the first podcast in this series that you have uh, tuned into, we will link the previous four down below. Uh, and if you'd liked uh, anything you heard, uh, know that this is not the last time we'll have these guys on the call. Uh, they they will or on the call on the podcast. They will be on again, and we'll we'll dive deeper into some of these topics. I'm sure. Uh, guys, really appreciate your time. Thank you uh, as always, and uh, and I look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Chris. Thanks,